League coming down to the Harvard of the South when Columbia joins. Well, we've got Neil Blackman from Saturday Down South, Florida Basketball Hour as well, joining the program. Neil, Neil. what it do, baby? It's good to have <laughs> you good, back, guys. brother. I think the What's first up, time man? on video, I think the last time was just uh, when we were just an audio media. Yeah, you know, you guys, you guys moved up in the world real fast. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're somewhere. Shout out to our sponsors for. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out, yeah. shout out to guys. Lucy Home. Had nothing to do with you. Yeah. Had nothing to do with you guys being being awesome. No, not at oh, all. Oh man, all your sponsors. Yeah, just, yeah. We'll buy stuff from our sponsors so we can keep leveling. We just up. hit a pump. Um, just hit a pump, sunshine, baby. <laughs> not last week, man. I didn't. I got a lot of anyway. So, uh, Neil, you are one of the uh, the foremost experts on Florida Gators basketball. Let's talk a little bit about them right now. Eighteen and seven, eight and four in the conference. Portal God Todd is now four and zero oh against Mike White. Um, but talk to us a little bit about the Gators. Seven of the last eight, a couple of big wins in there: Kentucky, Auburn. Uh, but uh, talk to us a little bit about the Gators basketball program. Yeah, man, they're good. Um, you know, the short short version is this is a good team. Um, it's a good team, and they've got the best guards in the SEC. Um, and I think that's – they don't have the best guard in the SEC. Alabama does, the team they'll play this week. But they have the best group of guards. Um, and, you know, elite guard play, as the season goes on, elite guard play wins college basketball games. And so, you know, what you're seeing is, is that. Uh, but you're also seeing Florida – has enough in the front court, right? It's not if something happens to Colin Castleton, he gets in foul trouble, he gets injured, you know, they're they're in deep trouble. It's not uh, the late year Mike White teams where there was one big man and really, you know, some guy that they took a flyer on coming off the bench to provide no help, um, really. Uh, so I think you have a deep front court and – you know, obviously Tyree Samuel is a big time player. He's played in the Big East, uh, which is a great league for multiple years. And he's been real good. Uh, but they're getting contributions now from the younger guys in the front court, whether it's Micah Hand locked in who came over from the Sun Belt. And, and he came from Marshall. So at Marshall, they play real fast. And he was kind of just a rim runner. Um, and they don't play much defense at Marshall. It's uh, Mike D'Antoni's brother coaches there. They they just want to get up and down. And I think adjusting to playing defense and physicality is huge for, it's just like football. I mean, if you go to the sec and you're a high level transfer uh, from a, a smaller league, there's an adjustment period usually, unless you're just a freak like Osiris Torrance. Right. So football translated basketball, I think Micah handlocked and learning how physical he has to be to contribute. And then uh, this staff, I mean, that, Look, the valuations that they made on these two young bigs, Thomas Hawk and uh, Alex Condon, um, I mean, the list of people who offered them is – it's interesting. I sent out a tweet the other day where, you know, I kind of put up the list that Tommy Hawk had, uh, and his best offer was Northwestern other than Florida. But Florida mm -hmm. trusted their evaluations, right? They put in the work and said – Here's what we see. Um, and some of that is Torian Green, which is what um, Todd told me on Saturday after Florida won was, you know, hey, we got this guy. We brought in Torian to, to run our player development program and to help with evaluations. And Tommy Houck, coach's kid, uh, played at a good program. And they were just, you know, Torian Green said, oh, you know, coach's kids have worked out pretty well here at Florida. <laughs> um, and uh you know, they, I, I like the way this guy plays and it's worked, man. I mean, Tommy's playing his best ball. And then Condon goes to this NBA Academy in Australia and, uh, you know, a lot mid-major programs that are good, like St. Mary's and Gonzaga have been mm -hmm. raiding that place for years. You know, Gonzaga raided it so much. They're not really considered a mid-major anymore. And Florida said, uh, we're going to go get this guy that has offers from St. Mary's, Gonzaga and Utah. And nobody else offered him in the entire country. We're going to offer him and see what happens. And he is so far ahead from an offensive standpoint than any freshman big that's been at Florida in, you know, probably 10 years. And Pat Young was joking. Pat that, Young. Yeah. yeah, Pat Young was joking that he, if I had his offensive skill set as a freshman, I wouldn't have played four years at Florida. So, so 
you said it's, it's Hawk. So Tommy Hawk is the forward that that yeah. is from Pennsylvania, and then Alex Conan is the other young freshman. So the point is, Florida has elite guards. I think they have the best point guard in the SEC in Zion Pullen. Mm -hmm. And then they have a front court that's getting better and better. So what they have is a chance to get better as the season goes on, even from where they are now, which is a team that's, you know, they lost one game by one point. That's mm -hmm. their only loss in the last month plus. That's crazy. Yeah. Tommy Hawk uh, goes off for 17 points, obviously a season high uh, for him, I guess a career high too, for playing that game. Uh, but uh, zero points against Kentucky, three points against Texas A&M, two points against Auburn, two points against LSU, and then goes off for 17 points, seven rebounds, a block shot, a steal, uh, just a, a great game uh, for him. Uh, Gators, obviously tough matchup ahead at home or uh, at Alabama, pardon me, this, uh, this Tuesday, uh, Alabama, I believe has won every game, but maybe one at home over the last two seasons or, or maybe have lost two. Uh, but, uh, what can the Gators expect, uh, going against Alabama, uh, tomorrow? Yeah, great question. Look, I, I think Florida will play pretty free and loose given the, the streak that they've been on, um, they didn't lose the game at Georgia. Obviously, they they had to come from behind win. I think that was huge. You know, Golden said it pretty well. He said, if we're going up to Alabama, coming off really what would have been our first bad loss of the year, uh, maybe we're tighter. Maybe we're desperate. We're afraid to make a mistake. I, I want to go up there and not be that. Um, and, you know, their one loss was to a team. Alabama's one loss at home was to a team sort of similar to Florida in that they have a dominant player, P.J. Hall, their big man, uh, and a really good offensive team that doesn't play great defense. And that's kind of how I would characterize Florida, a team that that is very good offensively um, but not great defensively. And that's how I'd characterize Alabama, right? Like Alabama doesn't guard anyone. Um, it, it's not last year's Alabama where they had Brandon Miller and Charles Bediaco, and they could just rough you up inside and really guard you, and they were physical, and that's how they got the number one overall seed. This team yeah. is a lot different. I mean, it's sort of a mid-major all-star team. Uh, Mark Sears, I think, is the best player in the SEC. He's he's a, a guard that they use a ton. Um, he's got a chance to be the first guard in the SEC since Scotty Wilbekin to have an offensive rating over 120 with a usage rate of 30. So that means that 30% of Alabama's possessions end with Sears taking a shot, committing a turnover, or drawing a foul. Like, mm, they are not – like, it's – it's uh, what what Silk say? It's like Novocaine, right? It's uh, – <laughs> you know what's coming, and it's still – it's going to work anyway. Um, <laughs> they, aren't, they aren't out there to confuse you. Shout out to Coach um, Herman Boone. Uh, yeah. We've yeah, got three Herman plays. Boone. Give them time. They work like Novocaine. Yeah, right. that's Alabama's <laughs> philosophy. I mean, they, they're going to shoot the three – and they are going to drive you and attack the basket. They don't take mid-range jumpers. Um, you know, they take what what uh, my guy Eric Foster would call, you know, either high quality, high percentage shots or or at the rim, or they take high reward shots outside the arc. And Florida, like Florida's going to give up 80, 85 points. It, is Florida going to be able to score with them? Probably. Uh, but I, I would expect it to be a pretty competitive basketball game. It's interesting, like, to me, having done Florida basketball hour for this, our sixth season of that, and, you know, Fawcett and I were talking about it, and this is the first time in late February where there's a path to the SEC championship. And if Florida wins this week, then that path is actually a lot more wide open than, than people realize. Yeah, I think I think I was reading that Florida is a Tennessee loss away from being able to control their own destiny. Uh, and I know yeah, the Tennessee right. schedule is not super, super easy uh, from here on out. Uh, Neil, before I forget, wanted to ask, I know that there was certainly a lot of excitement uh, about Riley Kugel coming back this year. I know towards the end of last season, he you know, was really lighting the, the basketball world on fire. And I know a lot of people thought that he, you know, could potentially go to the NBA last season uh, and was definitely a, a player to watch this season. It seems to me like we've gotten a lot of hot and cold from Riley Kugel this season, averaging 10 and a half points, uh, 3.8 rebounds um, this season. But what's, what's kind of been going on with, with Riley Kugel? Did, is it, yeah, I mean, mental, is it the way that yeah, he's playing? 
It's a great question. I think early in the year, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, they're not really running stuff for Riley. And that was nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, they were trying to get Riley around screens, trying to get him to attack the basket. They were trying to run plays where he could come off a screen and catch and shoot. And Riley was catching the ball and playing tentative. He was rejecting screens, which if you're six, five and built like a sec linebacker, you should not be rejecting screen set to get you downhill. Um, so he's been tentative. Um, he, he does not finish well at the rim. I'm not breaking any news on stadium and Gale. You guys know what you see with your eyes. You don't have to coach basketball or follow it like I do to, to know that. Um, and so that finishing problem has continued, but I think the early shooting slump kind of affected his confidence. Uh, he's, he's been shooting better lately, although um, the last two games, it's kind of been iffy again. The one thing he's done that I did want to, you know, I have been pointing out is, and I will say, and I think y'all know this, you know, cause you guys cover, a lot of different sports and, and football players in particular, like he's finding ways to impact winning. He is Florida's best defender uh, and has been all year, um, especially on the ball. And, you know, so all of that is great. Like this body language stuff. I don't, I don't put much into that. He was leading a team huddle uh, multiple times in the Georgia game. I was in Athens for that. Like, I mean, I think he's, he's a leader. He wants to win. But yeah, I mean the offensive struggles, Dan, are are real. Um, and for a guy that's one of the highest paid NIL dudes in the league, um, you know, I think it's safe to say it hasn't been the year that anybody hoped for. And if if Florida wants to make a deep run like second weekend, they need good Riley. They can't have, you know, the Riley at Georgia that they can't even put on the floor the last six minutes. We're hot right now. Uh doing pretty well is, is the blowing of leads still a, a concern for you yes yeah no it definitely is i mean look um they've had they've had seven leads this year of double digits in the second half and six of those games they've either lost or won by five points or less mm. that's not you know and i think so Todd said some of its mentality, like they, they haven't learned culturally how to keep their foot on the pedal yet. Um, and he said, that's, that's on me. That's on our staff. You know, we have to continue to impress upon them the need to do that. Some of that is that this team is disinterested defensively at times. Mm. So we saw that in the first half against Georgia. And I point that one out because everyone can see it in a comeback, right? Like, well, what's uh, defense if nothing that's just getting in the way of my next shot, Neil? Yep. Like, if we just don't play it, my next yeah. shot comes quicker. So when Georgia is getting into the paint at will with mediocre guards, like that's about want to. And that was the big challenge that they got from, from Coach Hartman and Coach Golden in the locker room at halftime against Georgia. It was like – what do you guys want your identity to be? Because right now it could be Walt Clayton and Zion Pullen are really damn good. <laughs> and the rest of you don't seem to want to help us win. Mm. And they don't, they're not normally calling out individual players like that, but I think that makes some sense. So Florida gets in front of Georgia and Georgia in classic Blanco fashion goes eight minutes without a bucket. Right. So how the Blanco, man. But some okay. of it was some of it's Blanco and their offense being like my offenses at Westminster Academy were more threatening than Blanco's. All right. Um, and some of it is also like Florida just guarded them. Right. They're like, you know what? We're not going to let you get in the paint every damn drive now. And I think Shout out to Mike White, the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. I'm well, well no doubt. Mike, and, but. but, but you look at this higher. Right. And now you look at the way he's worked the portal. I like Todd, the portal God. That's good. Yeah. Um, you know, he is, I think he's 12 or 13 and one against people hired contemporaneously with him. The wow. one loss was without Castleton to miss state in the sec tournament by a point. Um, so he's beaten the guys that were hired with him. Um, and I think 
because people keep asking me about it. I think the recruiting on the high school level, which is the next big piece from a program standpoint, is going to pick up soon. Um, but their evaluations have been too really good too, right? Like they signed what was supposed to be the worst class in the SEC, and they have two of the best five freshmen in the league. That's crazy. What um what does this roster look like? I mean, obviously, I know that the you know the last two seasons have been uh, transfer portal patchwork, and we're seeing it all over college basketball. It's not just at the University of Florida. Uh, what does this roster look like next year? Are they going to keep Clayton and Pullen and Samuel and Richard and Kugel and obviously Condon will 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 still be here. Uh, Hawk will still be here. What does this roster look like next season? So the two big challenges are they lose Zion Poland. He's out of eligibility. Okay. So he he's going to play. I think he's going to play in the NBA or the G League and be pretty good. Um, I've had five different SEC coaching staffs now tell me, man, we watched Zion Poland in the on film in the portal and we knew he was pretty good, but he's the best guard in our he's the best point guard in our league. Wow. Um, you know, I had a Kentucky assistant text me yesterday and said it's not even close either. He said it's not even close how much better he makes. So that is the biggest challenge for Florida will be how do you replace Zion Pullen? Um, I think Riley Kugel will come back. Uh, his NIL package beats what a G League deal would be. It's really mm -hmm. that simple. Um, and he has things to work on. And it, like, again, with Tori in here, Florida cares about development again, which my biggest, other than offense, the biggest problem under Blanco was players did not get better. Mm. It wasn't competitiveness. It wasn't defense. It wasn't, they won a lot of games, right? But the ceiling was so close to the floor because they weren't developing. They recruited pretty well, but they didn't develop them. Um, that's not the case with this staff. And then, you know, so, so I think they'll get Kugel back. Clayton is an interesting one to me because you you talk to five NBA scouts, you get five different answers. <laughs> right. get like, you know, to me, like I try to look at it. OK, step back. If it's my son. And he can score like a pro already and he just had a baby. You know, so either your NIL package for him is really good. And Florida's in a really good place from an NIL standpoint in basketball. And I don't think people understand because there's so much talk about like oh, Florida needs to, they need to buck up on NIL and football. And that's probably true. But like from an NIL space and hoops, it's a little easier. Like you get one or two or three big donors. Mm -hmm. Shout to Chandler Parsons. Yeah. You're good to go. Right. So Florida's war chest is fine. They could put together something for Walt. Does he want to be a college basketball player for another year? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, I mean, we saw Todd recruit, Colin Castleton back, but Colin's mm -hmm. situation was a little different. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, obviously, you know, we've seen a, a lot of talent uh, out of the transfer portal, and, and I would imagine you continue to see this development out of these guys. You're going to continue to see Florida being able to attract, you know, better and better talent out of that uh, the transfer portal. But, uh, you know, it's it's been miraculous work so far. Obviously, the job's not done with uh, with portal god Todd over there, but, uh, but so far the results are strong. You know, it's funny, he um, – he spoke to the Pinellas County Gators club a, a few months ago uh, and he didn't want to allude to the nickname. And then Paul Sammons, a, a friend of the program, a really good buddy of mine screamed out portal God Todd. And he just smiled. He's like, yeah, I've heard it. Uh, he's like, if that's what you want to call me, so that's what we're going to call him from, uh, from now on here. I like so, it. Um, so Gators right I, now, I privately texted uh, our stadium and Gale group text. And I think I texted Neil too, during one of those long, um, offensive droughts i said he might just be mike white with spreadsheets no and since then and since then just ripped off a string of wins so yeah yeah high proficiency with the spreadsheets <laughs> no, no, no yeah, they got so, uh so neil uh i guess final couple questions here gators right now sit in uh, in a decent position right now to compete, uh, you know, for the SEC regular season title here. Obviously, they'll they'll make it into the tournament. Uh, the SEC tournament obviously looks like they're going to make it into the uh, the NCAA tournament for the first time in a, in a number of years now. Wh where do you kind of forecast, you know, this Gators team likely finishing up this uh, this season? Yeah, I mean, I think that they'll go 
either four <clears throat> and two or five and one down the stretch. I, I okay. think that the, the coin flip game is the Bama game in the Odo. Um, and, you know, if they're five and one down the stretch, I mean, Fawcett and I were joking about it. Like if they're 13 and five, you mentioned, yeah, one game away from controlling your own destiny. Mm-hmm. If they finish 13 and five in the SEC, there's a, there's, there's still a not terrible chance they're SEC co-champions. It just wow. kind of depends on what happens with Tennessee. And like, does Tennessee have two losses in them? That's, that could be tough, but um, in any event, I think they'll get to 12 and six in the league. And then that should get them a five or a six seed. I think they're being undervalued a little bit by some of the bracketologists right now because mm-hmm. their strength of record is 17th. Um, so that would be like the first five seed. That's one of the things that they use. They don't just use Ken Palm. That's the one all the announcers talk about. But the committee uses Bart Torvik too, Florida's uh, top 16 in Torvik, which would be a four seed. Um, you know, and then I, like I said, elite guard play wins in March. It just, it has forever. That is a truism. So, you know, if Florida plays a team that doesn't have guards that are as good as theirs, which is most everybody, Mm -hmm. um, they will have at least somewhat of an advantage in the NCAA tournament. Now the holding leads thing, like could I see a scenario where Florida is in the second round and playing a three seed and they're up 15 points and say they're the six and they, they get a three, they're up 15 and then they collapse. Absolutely. I could see that scenario playing out. I could also see a scenario where Florida's guards carry them to the second weekend. And then depending on which one seed you get or which two seed you get, like there's no reason that they couldn't make an elite eight run. Um, What I don't want to see from anybody, this is my, my PSA use this few moments on stadium gale to, to PSA folks, please don't send me any bullshit in my DMS about how Mike white made the elite eight. And if Todd loses in the second round of the sweet 16, that proves like, no, like this Florida team is the best Florida team. Just pay attention to what you're watching. That's all I'm asking you to do. Mm -hmm. That they definitely turn the corner. uh, I don't know if you know this, you know, you watch basketball closely enough, but Mike white took the Florida team to the elite eight. Uh, (laughs) That's that's the one. Who who was it? Um, I think I think you guys shouted him out on the uh, the Florida basketball hour. Uh, there was somebody that was pumping Mike White's tires this uh, this off season. Oh, John Rothstein. John Rothstein. Uh, yeah, he said that uh, Georgia was uh, one of the better programs in the SEC, and that Mike White deserves credit for their start to the season. Uh, <laughs> they are playing like a traditional Mike White team now. So. Um, I'm sure that definitely are. Yeah. They, they definitely are playing like a I, I looked. I team. looked through his timeline. A lot of comments on basketball. None on Mike White or the Florida Gators uh, during that time. Uh, Neil, I do have a question for you. Right now, you mentioned Gator strength of, of record is 17th in the country right now. Still, Florida is not ranked. I mean, they, maybe they will be this uh, this week. But uh, why do you think Florida's not been uh, been ranked yet? Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the, that's an, that's a great one. And I think, look, I think the biggest reason is just the last couple of seasons of and public perception of the program, right? Like Florida went from having the longest NCAA tournament appearance streak in the sec to not being really a bubble team at all last year. Mm -hmm. Right. They went to the NIT, got blown out on their home floor by UCF. Um, They, the year before, they were barely on the bubble when they got to the SEC tournament, lost, Blanco quit the next day, went to Georgia. Um, so, yeah, no, good. I mean, it's – I still it's, can't believe the University of Georgia paid the University of Florida real American dollars for Mike White. It's astonishing. It's astonishing. Yeah. And, like, it actually – like, that is encouraging to me. Like, as an American just grinding, like, you just never know, like, you never know like what opportunity could befall you, even if you're mediocre. Yeah. No, that's I guess you're the the athletic director somewhere. You, uh, you're good for the rest of your career. I mean, good God. Uh, but, but so I think, I think there's a perception issue. Like it's still, and that's the thing. That's the attention and the eyeballs matter, man. They matter to recruits. 
they matter to, you know, I think this is as energized as the fan base has been about basketball in a long time. Florida started a year in the beginning of this decade, the COVID year, they start the year in the top five. Now they were in the top 25 some that year on and off, but they could never really get any consistency from a team that had a bunch of NBA players on it. Um, and so look, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think they should, they should probably be getting more respect than they're getting based mm-hmm. on their strength record, based on their efficiency numbers. I did see Gary Parrish, who I think is great. Um, put them in his top 25, but then uh, Tom Fletcher, who I think is great at on three, didn't have him in his ballot this week. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting. Like I'd hate for them to get ranked this week and get boat raced by Bama. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think, I think it'll be a competitive game. Neil, what we've seen the team kind of turning the corner uh, this year and showing some improvement. Uh, what are you seeing differently from from Todd Golden? Like how how has he become? He, it's like he's coming to his own a little bit. What are you seeing differently from him? No, that's a good question. Look, I think uh, I think that they they don't run a lot of stuff on offense, but what they run, they run really well. Um, and then it's a roster construction thing. Like they're this was a a huge development and roster construction were a problem under the prior regime. Mm. Um, this team has built a roster. Todd said, you know what I want to do? I want to go get really good guards that can run my ball screen offense. But then uh, when we miss shots, we have got to compete on the glass because it's the SEC and everybody's super physical. Well, Florida's second in the country in rebounding percentage, offensive rebounding percentage. So when they miss shots, they get second shots. Well, that's how you offset like, if you don't run elite offense, which I'd say Florida's offense is good, but again, it's not terribly multiple what they do, but it doesn't matter if you're getting multiple possessions every time, right? Like that's how you, you, what do you do to correct the things you're not as strong at as a coach yet? Well, you go out and build a roster that can handle some of your deficiencies. So Todd has done that really wisely, I think. Um, And Florida doesn't have a lot of wings, which has been a problem in a couple of their losses. They don't have those, you know, kind of six, five, six, 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 seven dudes that are real switchable can guard mm-hmm. five spots. Um, I, they would have had one with edge Jarvis, the kid from Yale. Yeah. Uh, he, he had to quit basketball, um, had a medical thing, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, like, look, it's still one of the most well-constructed rosters in the league. And again, getting his evaluations right with, with how can Condon is also, is also key. The one thing I will say too, Silk is like Todd is definitely a smart defensive dude. Like he understands defense. So I think that's a point of pride for him right now. It's like, why is my team looking disinterested defensively? Because it isn't my scheme. Like it's not what Florida does from an X and O standpoint. That's, that's hurting them on defense. It's, you know, just will, will to guard. Mm. Well, Neil, we appreciate your time today, my friend. I know that you're a busy guy and I appreciate you carving out a, uh, a probably longer uh, than a lot of time yeah. during your day to talk a little bit about Florida Gators basketball, but it's exciting uh, to talk about uh, the improvement that, uh, that the Gators basketball program uh, is making. And we appreciate your time before you leave, let everybody know where they can follow you. I know you do some writing. Obviously I know you have your podcast as well. So let everybody know where they can follow you along. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me. Uh, I get Twitter at NW Blackman, um, or you can follow the Florida Basketball Hour Twitter at Florida BB Hour. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, check out check out our podcast. Our, mm-hmm. I can tell people are excited because we've got ridiculously, you know, our for us <laughs> ridiculously good numbers right now. Good. Um, and that that's exciting because like we've we've been plodding along for six years, wondering when we'd have a really good team to cover. You know, not everybody gets to De La Tour or the, the Sully era. That's mm. right. Well, I also have to cover uh, f- four different football coaches. Yeah, well, so have I. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, Neil, again, thank you so much for your uh, your time today. Let's get you back on in a couple weeks and the Gators hopefully make that deep March run. We appreciate Thanks, your time, guys. my friend. We'll talk to you soon. See you.